we'll start uh, talking about uh, neural uh, function, how to visualize them. Last week, we discussed about uh, visualization of um, uh, uh, neural structure. So now let's move on to neural function. All right, so the organization and structure of the nervous system is uh, the first clue is being given about its function. So ultimately, we, uh, yeah, someone asked, well, why are we uh, trying to also study gene expression? Uh, we think about the final goal of us is a, uh, try to understand, let's say, on, on neural function related behavior or disease. So in that aspect, uh, our goal is towards more like function. However, function can be a lot explained by its structure as well. So that's why we start with the structure and organization. And now uh, the real question is how particular structure of these classes of cells giving rise to behaviors. So in neuroscience, I think ultimately we are more interested in behavior, our uh, mind, mental, and also um, uh, a disease related to uh, our mental status. So previously we studied uh, methods of studying morphology and gene expression patterns and also the connectivity of neuronal cells. Now we want to study method to how to visualize the electrical and biochemical activities uh, within neurons. So the goal for today's and this week's uh, study is uh, we are talking about techniques for visualizing the activity and function in first to fix the tissue. Okay, so EG1 first, and we will be discussing about non-electrophysiological methods of measuring neural activity, especially like uh, imaging. And lastly, uh, this will be on Wednesday, we will talk about techniques for visualizing protein function. Okay, so today we separate uh, and half, so we will be talking about static measures of activity and function. Uh, here we put static is, uh, we will be working with the, a fixed uh, um, brain. And then secondly, uh, visualizing the dynamic neural activity. Uh, so we call it dynamic on the other hand, uh, in comparison with the static. So we will be talking about a uh, lot of uh, sensors to visualize this neuronal activity. And finally, visualizing protein function. So I brought a movie uh, for you to watch. Uh, I hope this one will work very well with you. So this movie is actually done by an undergraduate student in GIST who graduated uh, two years ago. So she had done this experiment during her undergraduate thesis. So let's uh, see what I'm talking about. So it's in vivo calcium imaging in an anesthetized mouse brain through a cranial window. So we need to prepare a cranial window, which all of you guys will do a practice as a last uh, demonstration. Okay. Um, and uh, we put the apply calcium indicator. Uh, in this case, it's called uh, OGB Oregon Green Beta 2. So which is supposed to be about uh, like 100 times, 10 times brighter than the original OGB1 dye. So you apply OGB1 and that will be uptaken by neurons. And then when there is an activity, neuronal firing, the, these changes in intracellular calcium level will be converted into fluorescence intensity change. So this is uh, through the window. Let's take a look what uh, the mouse while under anesthesia, maybe it's under sleeping, what they think. Okay, let's take a look. So you see a little changes and a boom, like a little, little things and then boom. So this is a, a living mouse brain. Uh, you can see some very interesting dynamic changes. This small dot represent a single neuron. Um, and we go into 
a little more zoom in so that we can see, identify single cells. So the right hand ones are actually zoomed image. You can see like they are somehow connected uh, when they fire the nearby ones. You can see even firing of this axon or dendritic uh, uh, dendrites and somehow they work kind of together. Okay, and, and this is a uh, very interesting uh, results. Um, while we do not yet know what's going on, uh, how these neurons are like, how they are connected and what does this actually mean under the anesthesia? So anyway, you see also this uh, like waking, uh, uh, shaking, because it's in vivo experiments. If you don't uh, fix the mouse brain very well in this microscopic imaging, uh, the images can be like fluctuate, which will be uh, problematic when you will be uh, quantitatively analyze uh, the data later on. But anyway, I hope this gives you a, a kind of idea what uh, how uh, imaging a neuronal activity uh, is, uh, is like. Okay. So, uh, so far we are very, uh, we have been exposed to many kinds of uh, morphology of neurons or glia or cell types. But one big caveat is the cells are in fact very much dynamic. It's not um, like that static state most of the time. So here it's described as the living cell is a dynamic wonder. Okay. Uh, so to understand the rule of the game for this uh, cellular neuronal dynamics, uh, we have to also understand how uh, not easy to, to just watching a snapshot. So I give an example of cricket game. Uh, how many of you have done cricket game? Okay, nobody? I know some, uh, some of my Pakistani students and fellows uh, love. Uh, so I personally haven't done it, but uh, if you look at this cricket game, and these are like snapshots of the game, uh, like this one as well. Do you have any idea how, what's the, how does the game actually works? The rule of the game. So these are like snapshot, a nice one. Think of this as the, the image you take for the neurons and, and uh, gliads inside the brain. Then like it's, yeah, personally, if I watch these a uh, number of snapshots, it may be very hard for me to still understand how, uh, how the rule of the game actually, how the game works. So one can learn about the biological system by observing dynamic events that take place within the neurons. Um, so if the best way of understanding cricket game for me is to actually watch the movie and how they score and so that I can correlate what uh, makes the score and what's uh, allowed and what's not allowed. So the rule of game probably would be best understood by watching the series of dynamic moment as a movie rather than a, a several snapshot of the image. So this is kind of an idea why uh, this uh, dynamic event is hard to understand. And our goal uh, as a uh, studying neuroscience is actually uh, giving us some idea. So that's related to the technology. I think um, Shukla today said about light sheet microscope to show the whole brain connectivity. Uh, that's one thing, but light sheet microscope is having a sheet to go through the whole brain very fast. So this advantage of the dynamic imaging can allow us to see the fast changes in the whole brain of zebrafish. So this is first time. Uh, so I want to share this one with you. Whole brain functional imaging at the cellular resolution by use of light sheet microscope. So this is a uh, one cover of this image. It came from Nature Methods uh, from the Janelia Research Farm campus. So look at this. These are a living zebrafish. The cool thing about zebrafish is a young zebrafish, the body is almost transparent so that it allows us to actually 
do imaging uh, um, in vivo throughout the brain. You see this uh, projection view of this frontal view and the lateral view and the top view. All of these uh, bright dots are in fact, you can see here, DF overlap, which means the fluorescence is proportional to the neuronal activity. And DF is that changes in fluorescence are normalized uh, from zero to one. So you are actually watching the active neurons, uh, neural activities throughout the whole brain. This is a fascinating thing uh, to see for the first time, uh, the whole brain imaging. Of course, can, can we do this in mice? No, because mouse brain is much opaque and much bigger than this zebra fish. You see, this is 100 micron scale bar. Then from here to here, it's about one millimeter probably about typical of a good microscope field of view with a high enough resolution. All right, so, so this is a kind of a um, intensity projection at some point, but we want to see how things actually happen as a dynamics. So I brought this uh, movie of another uh, study, which is uh, titled as a sensitive red for protein calcium indicators for imaging neural activities. Uh, as you know, the famous green fluorescent protein <clears throat> gives us a green fluorescence. While if we are interested in, let's say, curious about neuron and glia and their interaction, and neurons activity may be represented by a green fluorescence uh, with a calcium indicator. So this uh, is about study showing that, hey, there's a red, red fluorescent protein, which can actually also show neural activity, okay? So this is another cell type. When they have two different activities, we can actually watch them together. So this is the key why this is very interesting paper that results showing that uh, over time, you see two different green and red. So there are like one, two, three four reasons of interest. You are watching over time. You see how they are activate and their activity changes. Like these arrows shows uh, some of this uh, uh, region of interest so that you can see one, two, three different parts of this uh, brain region, uh, the activity and also the red fluorescent, which is an another calcium indicator. So you can actually watch different types of neurons or neuron and glia interaction by use of this technique. So this is a very fascinating uh, uh, advancement in this neuroscience because you are seeing the space, spatial arrangement between among different um, the cells and neurons and glia. And at the same time, you are actually having this temporal resolution. So which gives us a dynamic event, what happened. So this particular one was actually done in a mouse visual cortex, the V1 area. Uh, so this is related to visual. So even an anesthetized mouse, you can actually uh, simulate the visual system that it will be showing this kind of response. Okay, so uh, with this uh, introduction, I want to discuss about like how to visualize electrical and biochemical activity in neurons. So as I just showed you that this fluorescence is a fascinating uh, um, tool because it gives a, a specificity under a very dark background. So using fluorescent dyes and proteins with a microscope allows us to visualize the functional processes even in fixed tissue and our optical characterization of electrophysiological properties of neurons can be done by this fluorescent dye. Okay. And methods to visualize and manipulate biochemical dynamics. So, so with this tool is very good. So let's get started with the functional aspects by use of static markers of activity. So this is about you know, when you are, um, when we perform an experiment with the animal during certain behavior or certain treatment, you can immediately fix 
the mouse brain, okay? And then you can actually start to see, look for the clue gene. In this case, I call it as an immediate early genes or IEGs, okay? So this immediate early genes are the genes that are rapidly transcribed in response to cellular stimuli, which could, uh, such as neuronal activity, or which can come from, let's say, visual stimulus or neuromodulation or electrical stimulus or fear, uh, whatever it is. And they are implicated in synaptic plasticity and synaptogenesis, meaning that making, creating new synapse and the strengthening or uh, weakening of synapse, synaptic connections. So many immediate early genes are in fact transcription factors and DNA binding proteins and have the ability to activate specialized signaling cascade. So uh, to help you, I actually update this, uh, edit one more picture over here to just help you what, how does this work? So for example, there are extracellular signals uh, coming from, let's say a sudden um, stimulus, visual stimulus or uh, neuromodulation and that can go into the signal, uh, can elicit signaling uh, event on, inside the cell, and they will uh, cause this immediate early genes uh, activation. So induction of IEG expression. And some of them are c force and c June, which you will be here uh, later on. And another assay, cellular function in fixed tissues, uh, in, include a cell proliferation uh, can be studied uh, with the um, a contrast by use of thymidine analogs. And sometimes you also want to study uh, intracellular protein trafficking uh, with a famous pulse tracing labeling. I'll be discussing this uh, next slide. Okay, so some cellular functions can be examined through the use of activity markers you know, fixed histological sections. Okay, so we are talking about after events happens and we start to fix the brain and then we are talking about this uh, function, okay? So measuring neural activity, uh, I'll tell you what, indirectly, okay? By measuring some products that accumulate during specific processes. Let's see, Jibam, uh, Yes, can you guess what that is? So I want to measure neural activity indirectly. Yes, actually, oh, byproduct. Sorry, I, spelling is wrong, B-Y product, I think. The byproduct that accumulate during specific processes. And incorporating a marker into cells that indicate the presence of activity during subsequent histological examination. So we are talking about fixed tissue, but uh, subsequent after the activity. So these are two ways of looking at the cellular function. But we are talking about like after uh, sacrificing uh, the brain or fixing the brain. So this only provides a snapshot of activity of one moment in a dynamic, the whole process. So there are limitations, but this is a good starting point. Let's uh, get into one by one. So first an example is about, uh, I said about visual cortex before, and hey, the location of visual cortex is on the a little backside, okay? You can see this in V1, it's one side and the other is a contralateral side. So let's say I want to see uh, the visual, visual stimulation, how does that relate to the, the brain, especially in visual cortex region. So measuring activity labels uh, by, then it would be good to measure or label immediate early genes. Uh, with immunohistochemistry or in situ 
hybridization, which we discussed last week. Okay. So after visual stimulation, uh, we want to see if we can apply visual stimulation only one eye. Let's say we block left eye and then open up on right eye, and then we give a visual stimulation. Okay. And then we have a contralateral uh, uh, visual cortex and ipsilateral visual cortex, and we can start to compare the expression of immediate origin. Let's take a look at the, the results. So this A and B, A is contralateral and B is ipsilateral. Okay, what happens? You see this, uh, this one, two, three, four, five, six uh, represents uh, the inside the cortex, cortical layers, and in mouse, has a little bit less distinction between two and three in humans. So that's why it's a two, three area we, uh, layer. And you can see these layers, these are little dots, uh, dark dots are actually immediate origin expression, okay? While on the other side, this is kind of self-control and you see the number of these black dots compared to these are quite different. That's what you see over here. So this is a good way to see, hey, somehow this one side visual stimulation through one eye probably is linked with the expression of immediate early genes in this contralateral visual cortex. Okay, so that's what you can actually hypothesize. Oh. So this immediate early gene is a, a neural activity is leading to transient and rapid um, so Ji-hoon, rapid translation or transcription of a group of things within minutes. Transcription. Oh, very good. So this is the first uh, part, what's happening. So rapid transcription can happen within minutes. For example, C force transcription uh, is done within 15 minutes. So this is a very good way of uh, checking out the neural activity. How does that relate it to this uh, uh, gene expression? So immediately genes encode, uh, in fact, proteins, and which is mostly a transcription factors. Uh, that is an example is a force gene and cytoskeletal interconnecting proteins such as ARC protein and phosphorylated ribosomal subunits. So this is uh, phosphorylated for the P and S6. Uh, this is a subunit of ribosome. So these are some of the examples. Okay, so uh, then how we can assay, how, how do we get this contrast, find out this? So assaying method either I to show the expression of immediate early genes Okay, or I to show expression of their protein products. Okay, so either of this, let me see, Yoo Sung Young. So the first one, can you guess which one is? ISH. This one. Yeah. Okay, and then the second one? IH. Great, yes. So all correct because the expression of uh, immediate allergens is about the mRNA expression. So gene expression, we can use in situ hybridization to check this. While the, their protein product, we need to use immunohistochemistry to detect. Okay, so that is a, a good example for that. And but we have to note that immediate allergens cannot be a standalone indicator. You can't trust this for all the time, okay, of activity because there are many uncontrollable factors and only used as a first clue to the function of a brain region because you don't know whether other confounding factors involved with the um, experiment may affect many of this immediate early gene expression, okay? So this is a first clue and so it requires us to follow up once you find it with more reliable measurement of neuronal, neural activity, okay. So, so you can think of this immediate allergen pattern 
as a, a screening neuron for the presence of activities that correlate with the specific behaviors. So let's say you are studying, let's say, uh, sleep or pain, then like, let's say about pain. So you give a painful stimulus to the animal and you wait for, let's say, uh, several or 10 minutes, and then you take out the brain and then check this immediate origin expression. Then it may give a specific brain area uh, showing the expression of, of the gene, immediate origin. So, so that you may want to, hey, I want to study um, acute pain and I give acute pain in, in the brain region, you check the, the a quick uh, gene expression of immediate origin, you may find a, a different areas which is expressing. So that could be a good starting point as a screening tool. So that way you can think of this immediate gene, early gene uh, pattern and use. Okay, so now I want to discuss another assay of cellular function in fixed tissue, which is related to a cell cycle. Uh, here, I give you uh, the same section with the two different staining. So the left one is called the BRDU stain and the right one is a KI67. Sorry, the names are very, uh, I think for, these are, could be very new, uh, but I want to show uh, the BRDU is a bromodeoxyuridine, uh, which people say it's carcinogen. So you gotta be careful working with, uh, with this, okay? Um, so this is a tag DNA base pair analog. So it has a tag, okay? So this is a synthetic analog of DNA based thymidine. You guys all remember the DNA is composed of uh, four base pairs, A, T, G, C, that T stands for thymine, thymidine, okay? So this is a, a BRDU will replace this, and but it has this bromo uh, deoxyuridine, so it is by itself a tag, so that it shows DNA synthesis phase of the mitosis. Or you could use a very sensitive radioisotope of this trichated, uh, uh, this hydrogen, so, H3 thymidine is a radioactive trichated thymidine. So you could use this one. Then it can be incorporated into, uh, into the cell when there's a DNA synthesis. So this is a, a very uh, good way of showing this mitotic phase. And another is a KI67 or called the PCNA uh, stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen. So it it is a marker for cell proliferation. This is actually a protein present during the active proliferating stages of the cell cycle, but not present in the other resting phase. So this is a good marker for, hey, I'm proliferating phase. So that you can see this KI67 marker, okay? So in a cell cycle, DNA synthesis phase of mitosis can be marked by tag DNA base pair analog, which is in this case a BRDU or this H3 thymidine. Now, how do you tag this? While the cells has to be uh, uh, getting these molecules, so you have to inject this into an animal, for, for example, by um, in, uh, 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 the intravenous injection or cells or tissue in tissue culture, if you are in primary or tissue culture, you can put it on top and add into culture media. Then the cells will incorporate them to make a new DNA molecule. All right, so by introducing a marker in live tissue during a process of interest, which allows us to detect the marker in subsequent histological logical examination, which you, after you fix the tissue. So how do you uh, use this one? This is all immunohistochemistry, okay? So you detect the proteins against, uh, so you're using antibody against the BRDU, then you, this one will tell you, tell us about the cells were active, actively dividing, okay? Because it's about uh, mitosis. 
during the time of Chinook? Uh, during the time of when you give this BRDU to the system? Uh, injection. Exactly. So we are talking about that time of injection. These are like act actively dividing. And what about KI67? Uh, immunohistochemistry, chemistry, so we use antibody against this protein, PCNA antigen, the cells were actively proliferating prior to <clears throat> Genuk again. Perfusion. Exactly. You, you see the timings are different. So uh, when we interpret this, hey, during the perfusion, these are or proliferating, <clears throat> but the time when you gave BRDU, that time these cells, actually these are the same section, these cells are actually uh, dividing phase. So that it gives a different uh, kind of information for us. So this is a repeat, so I won't spend too much time, but uh, BRDU is a synthetic analog of DNA-based thymidine and you use microscopic examination of this inter intracellular structure. So it can be detected using uh, immunohistochemistry because you are detecting this uh, protein. And all radioactive uh, tritiated thymidine can be detected using a different method to detect this radioactivity. So it's autoradiography, very sensitive, okay? So this one, uh, I want to discuss about the limitation of this approach. So, because this is a snapshot of at the time of injection or at the time of uh, perfusion phase, uh, whether the cell did afterwards, we, we killed the animal already, so we don't know what happens next. So, whether the cells were continued to proliferate or stopped dividing to become a functional differentiated cell. So we have no uh, clue uh, or idea or confirmation afterwards because we already stopped uh, this experiment. So now I want to discuss about uh, another protein trafficking uh, with a famous so-called purse and trace uh, labeling experiment. So in some cases, we want to study uh, in a biochemical pathway, how some of the uh, molecules actually are moving from one to the other to the other over time interval, okay? So we want to observe a movement of a substance through a biochemical or a cellular pathway. So a good idea for this is actually uh, like the previous BRDU experiment, which you inject BRDU that will be incorporated into the DNA. And then you can see, hey, these uh, cells were actually dividing because you inserted a marker for that. So likewise, in a living system, you can also do very similar things be, uh, by use of a labeled probe, okay? But if you keep, keep sending this label, uh, it, it kind of obscures the temporal sequence. So one way to do this experiment is you give a marker for a brief time. So it's described as a pulse. So you give a marker and stop giving the marker. Then you can see how the marker uh, moves along the cellular pathway. Then you only need to get, let's say, 10 minutes after you, you take out the sample. 20 minutes after you take, 30 minutes you take out. By this way, by giving a marker for only a brief, uh, a short amount of time, you can actually see over time interval, you can have a, a different um, a cut, and then you can find out the overall sequence uh, of protein trafficking. So this is a basic idea. So I want to show uh, just so this is a concept. So it will be very easy that uh, in this process as a, a, B, C, D is a process and you want to see how things happen uh, specifically, then in a brief time you give a pulse. This is a yellow color so that the mix will be green and then you stop it. 
and it's called chase. So now it's a chase mode. You only watch these green things, uh, how they move around. So that this gives a, a, a pretty good way for us to, to discover what's happening uh, throughout this biochemical uh, or cellular uh, process. So that labeled probe is called a pulse, which is either injected into the animal or added to culture of cells for a brief period of time. And then after washing very thoroughly away the pulse so that it remained as a pulse and by replacing this with unlabeled molecules. So that following changes in the localization of the marker in different uh, cellular compartments over time, then we can do protein trafficking. Uh, pathway can be studied. Let's see, Choi Yu Jin. Exactly. In this case, we are talking about like even inside a cell of the, the movement of the molecule uh, with subcellular compartments such as, let's say, a nucleus, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, and other uh, small vesicles. Okay. So an example is biochemical synthesis pathways, or people have discovered uh, how does release of neurotransmitter by use of this method. Okay, so with that, I want to, um, I brought a uh, very similar experiment, which is uh, regarded to as the most beautiful experiment in biology. So this is not exactly first trace experiment, but based on this concept, uh, we actually uh, discovered the DNA replication mechanism. So to give you a certain uh, hist histor historical perspective, you guys all learned and know that in 1953, Watson and Crick proposed a, the, the structure of the DNA model. And then they indicate that this uh, double helical structure automatically indicate a copying mechanism, which is the secret of heredity. So when they published their paper in Nature, and uh, you know, people will argue about it, whether this is true or not, because you haven't done the experiment. This is like kind of theory, okay? So DNA synthesis method, uh, and subsequently, uh, Watson and Crick also proposed how the copying mechanism, so double helix of DNA, the backbone, they will be detached and then uh, another one will uh, attach and the other will be complementary attached and they will be uh, flowing the information can be copied. But if you think about it, there are other ways of mechanism as well. So these are like three, uh, all this debate was very active at the time. So this is a, what uh, Crick and Watson proposed called, called uh, one of each of these backbones remain and the other will be uh, 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 produced here. While, hey, this could be also possible, conservative. Hey, I know this sequence, so this sequence will remain the same, a total new, the same one can be made. Who knows, okay? And especially at the time, uh, Caltech, uh, who is also a Nobel laureate in biophysics, uh, Max Delbrick, was arguing very much against his idea that, hey, who knows why, why this is true? Because DNA is a cold structure. This will be very unlikely and difficult to happen. So in the end, he actually proposed this dispersive. Uh, so some part will be original and the other part will be new and they will be mixed up. You know, nobody knows. Uh, you can, so this is kind of a very important debate about hypothesis, how DNA synthesis and how this replication uh, happens. And so what's important in this debate is when, you know, when you guys are working in a, a research field, a very hot area, you need to identify this, like uh, what are the big issues and hot debate. And if you solve this, you could even sometimes get Nobel Prize. But when you are thinking about this, important thing is you need to think you can propose these, these different hypotheses, but what matters is even higher level is, can you propose an experiment which will resolve this issue? 
that is the most important in, in I would say, in, in research, okay? So you think about this and these are a key ideas of, hey, if like we uh, made this color, like original template uh, is a red color, and let's say somehow we can give a contrast to newly synthesized trend as a pink, then this red and pink are different, okay? So uh, how can you give a contrast? This is an idea at the time, a graduate student in Caltech, uh, uh, Matthew Masserson, and collaborate with another one who is in the different part of the, uh, of the US. Hey, if we give a different a mess to this original and the new template, by use of, let's say, you know, isotope, which has a different mass, very fine mass, okay? Then what happens? So if they have different uh, mass, then in this, in this case, conservative case, you will have to see, uh, let's say the red is heavy, heavy one and light one by use of ultra centrifugation. In fact, Messerson's a, this is their expertise is like ultra centrifuge to, to detect, uh, to analyze. So that actually helped. Will be like this, but what if this um, is exactly half and half, then both this uh, strand and this strand will have almost the same mass. So it will be in the middle, almost half and one line will be coming. What about the other, like who was actively uh, criticizing Watson and Crick at the time, who is a, a big figure in, you know, uh, Caltech professor, that this person one, this is kind of random event. So you would expect maybe not exactly one singer, but it will be like different types of masses around. So this is a key idea uh, to designed by Messerson and Starr. So they actually used uh, E. coli uh, bacteria as a model system so that they give this uh, nitrogen with 15 and 14. So this is uh, the different mass, very little, but you have generated N15 nitrogen based uh, DNAs in E. coli one time and the other nit nitrogen 14. And then uh, you start uh, mix them to replicate, okay? Then initially, uh, or, so initially N15 is first, but the second generation uh, of, uh, they have used nitrogen 14, then you will see the first generation, the band is different. And third generation, uh, zero first, second, it starts to diminish and this one will come up. So you see a beautiful, uh, beautiful lines, which is actually uh, indicative of the semi-conservative uh, ones. So by this experiment uh, done, I think in 1957, which was published in PNAS 1958, like the world scientists all were debating this and the debate is closed because this is so clever experiment to show, hey, this semi-conservative uh, things are actually happening. So this is like a historic and a famous one. So this is an idea indicating that uh, very re relevant to our pulse chasing experiment. All right, so the debate over DNA replication, I strongly urge you to, to read this final link because you know we are learning all this one just in the class. We memorize semi-conservative, which is not fun at all, but I want you to actually read this, actually what's happening, how we actually reach to this conclusion uh, through an active debate. And this is uh, quite uh, interesting. Okay, so the final about 10 minutes, I will uh, be talking about visualizing neural activity. Okay, so, you know, neural activity should be spatial and temporal nature, okay? So we need the tool to have spatial temporal resolution and we need the tool to visualize those. 
So we already learned and studied this before. So remember in whole brain imaging and the uh, initial uh, lectures, or let's say um, fMRI, functional MR imaging, uh, which gives a spatial resolution of about a millimeter size. Okay, which is not cellular level, but it's actually pretty decent if you consider about the human brain. Uh, so that spatial resolution, one millimeter, can be related to neurons for how many neurons? Uh, you can think of, let's say, a neuronal cell body as about 10 micron size. So 10 micron is about 10 to the minus one um, meter, uh, not meter, 10, uh, 10 micron is 10 to the minus five uh, micrometer. So that one millimeter, it's about 10 to the fifth neurons. So we are talking about a hundred thousands of neurons at the same time with uh, the use of whole brain imaging. And temporarily, so it takes several seconds because functional MRI is not directly watching the neural activity, but indirectly observing the subsequent hemodynamic changes uh, of the blood, okay? So that gives uh, that whole brain imaging about this space and temporal resolution. And we also studied electrophysiology by sticking an electrode nearby or inside the neuron and to detect and study the electrical activity or membrane potential chain. And so you can actually stick into one single neuron or even um, patch clamp. So you can see single neuron and space. So that's uh, fascinating. And then temporal resolution. So it's elect electrophysiology and you know electricity is uh, very fast, right? So the resolution is about millisecond. Uh, so Action potential, the order of the timing is about milliseconds. So it's great in temporal, but the problem is you can only probe and study one single neuron at a time, or maybe a couple of neurons uh, simultaneously, not the bigger reason or the whole comprehensive. So in this regard, uh, optical approach has quite an interesting uh, characteristics. Why? Uh, depending on the uh, zoom in, you can actually watch at the single neuron cellular level, which you already saw optical imaging, microscopy can see a single, but at the same time, you can have uh, a big field of view, let's say about hundreds microns and hundred micron, which can contain a thousand of neurons, which are interconnected. So single or thousands of neurons at once you can actually uh, study them simultaneously. So in spatial resolution is quite interesting to cover this. And what about temporal resolution? Uh, because it's optical imaging, you can have a quite different uh, ranges of exposure time. You can have uh, a second order. Sometimes you can have very fast event of even millisecond order you can observe. Of course, I think we have to um, understand the caveat that, you know, this time window uh, are actually related to the amount of uh, photon signal. So fast ones are not necessarily always work very well. You need to have enough uh, of photon or signal to be able to go faster imaging. So there are, uh, uh, you need to understand whether this is not just, hey, because of this, we can always measure one millisecond uh, frame, which convert it into a thousand frames per second, hmm. you gotta be very careful on that, on that aspect. However, depending on the contrast, you can actually use it. So visualizing neural act activity, uh, I'm talking about directly imaging voltage membrane potential of a neuron or sometimes glia that activity, neuronal activity is related to this voltage change or membrane potential change. So you can, that can be very fast and important. Or another one is in neuronal activity, they'll involve a calcium uh, ion uh, concentration changes. So that calcium dynamics is a, a very good, uh, another way of imaging neural activity. All right, so where, to, where can you use it? 
We can use dissociated cells and tissue slice, such as brain slice in bath media, or even you can use the intact brain, which I already showed uh, the first movie I showed, which is an intact brain. So special fluorescent probes are necessary for this. Uh, we can try to see the changes in membrane potential or calcium concentration and sometimes synaptic vascular fusion. So types of probes are uh, a number. So the first one is a organic dyes, okay? So you use these dyes. Uh, you basically, what you have to do is you have to add to a neural system before the experiment. So it's a little cumbersome, but this is an exogenous dye, okay? Such as like calcium indicator or voltage sensitive dye. And because it's exogenous, usually better, having better temporal properties and signal to noise ratio will be usually better. However, most of the time, these are like maybe one time measurement uh, because you have to add it before the experiment. So the other aspect is more stably expressing genetically in coded because it's in, into the gene fluorescent protein. So it's not just dye, it's a fluorescent protein which has to be you know, translated and transcribed from the gene, okay? So the good thing about this is you can have stably expressing this fluorescent protein in a transgenic animal or cell. It has to be transgenic, right? Because it's also exogenous, but uh, you have to incorporate. And the good thing about this is now, because you are using genes, so you can target to specific cell types based on their genes in the brain to observe activity in a molecularly defined circuit. So fluorescent probes, we can image voltage, we can image calcium dynamics, you can image synaptic transmission. So today I'm gonna to only cover uh, voltage sensitive dye imaging as an example. So as I said, in, uh, for optical access to the brain, we do need a craniotomy and we can have a craniotomy of covering both uh, somatosensory cortex called S1 and motor cortex M1. Uh, what we do is we gave a voltage sensitive dye. One example is RH1691. It's a famous dye you apply to this. And then what are we doing here is um, we want to study the brain regions activity related to whisker. Okay, so you cut off all the other whiskers and remain C2. You remember the better cortex uh, has a whisker map? And C2, you actually stimulate plus this C2. And you want to observe the sensory and motor, okay? So how does this uh, coming in space and time is what you are interested, okay? So let's take a look at this experiment. When we do this, after 14 milliseconds, remember this is very fast, 14 milliseconds, this, you know, sensories are your backside of the brain, motor is, frontal side, okay? So backside the sensory shows up up until 22 milliseconds. And you now notice this M1 motor cortex actually light up and 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, you now see the temporal and spatial dynamics of how this sensory, somatosensory cortex and M1 related to C2 whisker and up until 60 milliseconds. And I have to say this look kind of beautiful, but it's not that easy uh, because you see n equal 10 trials. And I want to show uh, this delta F over F. So this is a relative change above the background. You see, this is percentage zero to one. So this one is only 1% difference. I mean, this is very, very uh, little signal. So you gotta be careful to know you need to have a very good background subtraction. You need to a very good camera, which is which you have to suppress the noise. And not only one time, but you have to repeat this, okay, multiple times. So in this case, 10 trial average can give you a, something you can analyze. 
So this, let's say this uh, timing, so that has 50 millisecond and 0.1% here. So the strength of the signal S1 and M1 looks like this. So this S1 sensory rises up and it comes down exponentially decaying. And then this M1 motor cortex have some time delay or up a little bit less, but the peak is actually, there's just some time interval. So that's like this and this probably about less than 10 millisecond difference. You can actually detect this, okay? And then come back. And the difference between these two are actually about 0.1%. You know how small this is, all right? So, but anyway, spatial temporal dynamics of voltage changes across the brain cortex can be studied in this way. All right, so we are visualizing the changes in membrane potential, right? And this membrane potential measurement by optical mean is very similar analog to electrophysiological recording. The difference is electrophysiological, usually we are only focusing one or uh, very nearby neuron while we are seeing the whole entire mouse brain. Okay, so that dye is called the voltage sensitive dye imaging and which is a primary method. <coughs> also at the same, this one is called, we are measuring membrane potential. So it's called potential metric dyes. And this dye will change. In fact, what's happening is their spectral properties. So <clears throat> membrane potential change allows this VSD dye change, conformational change, or their shape change, which leads to spectral change, which you can detect uh, as a color change in response to this voltage change. So, but this is exogenous and people say this is kind of one time use because you, once you inject, you probably cannot use it because it has some toxicity. Uh, so the other way is the Gavi or genetically encoded voltage indicator. And that you can image potentially a genetically defined cell type because this is already a transgenic. So that is a protein that can sense membrane potential in a cell and relate the change in the voltage to form of output, in this case of fluorescence. Uh, I gave an example at the beginning of we can give a green fluorescent protein to study multiple, you can have another color, red fluorescent protein. So these are very fascinating uh, part of this uh, imaging. And voltage is the most related to this uh, neuronal uh, activity. All right, so the principle is this dye will shift absorption or emission fluorescence. You guys know excitation emission uh, profile of fluorescence, which is based on the membrane potential and giving a global electrical state of a neuron. So what are the advantages for this? So you can measure uh, large, not single, but populations of neurons at once. And very important aspect is uh, because you are directly measuring the voltage, it's, you can detect sub threshold synaptic potential in addition to spiking activity. Of course, spiking activity gives the highest signal, but even sub threshold, if you have a good enough signal to noise ratio, which do not lead to action potential, but you can actually study that. So characteristics and data representations are usually you see signal duration, intensity, SNR, and the toxicity. And something you have to uh, get, getting some sense of this is fractional intensity change, which is delta fluorescence over baseline fluorescence. And this order in this VSD is very low. I'm talking about here 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus three or 0.01% to 0.1%. This is so little so that the signal is so little that you need to have a uh, multiple repeat. So very little noise is necessary and you need a very good tool for that. And so another caveat for this is uh, you are based on this uh, imaging. In fact, there are activity dependent changes in intrinsic optical absorption because of the hemodynamic change. And 
also that reflection uh, can interfere with the voltage sensitive dye imaging. So these are potential issues we have to keep in mind. And there are um, a number of different GAVIs or genetically encoded voltage indicators. So I just give you, this is a kind of example, uh, but the cool thing is molecular defined subsets of neurons can be labeled and you can study them. All right, let me summarize. Uh, the visualization to observe neural activity and protein function will allow us to study how proteins determine the properties of neurons. And the neurons determine the properties of circuits and ultimately behavior. So we talk about static markers and visualizing neural activity part of the voltage. All right, uh, thank you for your